he beat her by 49% among Republican voters. That is a spanking by any political definition. It was like, well, she didn't win, but let's not give him the full credit for what he did. This is the knot that the, the media tries to tie itself in. I mean, I could, I could rattle off a dozen names of journalists who wrote books about Trump, right? Do you think, you don't think they want to write another one? I mean, come on. And plus all the clicks that they get on social media. And uh, I, Donald Trump is the best thing that's happened to journalism in the last half century. They don't want him to, they don't want him to exit the stage. Of course not. All right. Welcome to the Sean Spicer Show. It is Wednesday. We have made it halfway through the work week and there is a ton to break down with you. The results of the New Hampshire primary, Donald Trump coming in with a strong and commanding win. First time since 1976 that a candidate that not an incumbent has won Iowa and New Hampshire, and he's done it big in both places. Record turnout in New Hampshire and the biggest win ever for a candidate in the New Hampshire primary. Nikki Haley says she's fighting on, but let's be real. I don't think it's going to happen. She's got 30 days till the uh, South Carolina primary. That's a lot of time to go. Uh, we'll see. I thought we'll get into this about her, how she got out, how she reacted last night. Trump making it clear he's not getting mad. He's getting even. Plus a leaked tape out of Arizona urging, not urging, bribing Carrie Lake to drop out. We're going to talk about that. Plus Joe Biden, a big shakeup in his campaign headquarters that they tried to bury. We're going to break all that down with our guest, Tim Murtaugh. Tim was the 2020 communications director for Trump's campaign. Plus he's got a book coming out uh, called Swing Hard in Case You Hit It. It's a really compelling personal story. I'm going to ask him about as well. A lot to break down with Tim Murtaugh. Let's get into it. You know, uh, Tim, when we had you on the show, uh, booked for the show, I thought this is great. There's no one better to talk um, New Hampshire than Trump's former comms guy. Uh, but then all this stuff went down with this Carrie Lake video uh, with Biden claiming that Terry McAuliffe is the real governor of Virginia. So I, I was like, I, I just got the trifecta, the right. I mean, you talk about sometimes you <laughs> hit the jackpot. I want to get to it all, but let's start with what everybody's talking about. Uh, New Hampshire. Trump wins by double digits, wins big with um, with Republican voters. What is your takeaway this morning in terms of if, if you're the Trump campaign, where this thing stands? Well, if I'm the Trump campaign, I'm feeling really, really good about where things stand. Um, you know, as you know, in, in a contested primary, this is the first time since 1976 that somebody has won both Iowa and New Hampshire. And, you know, just like circumstances could not possibly have been better for Ron DeSantis in Iowa, it is never going to get better in any state moving forward for Nikki Haley than it just was in New Hampshire. I mean, she had the support of the incumbent governor. She had a, a primary system which allowed Democrats to switch parties up to a certain point to go vote in the Republican primary. He had a, he had a, a outsized number of undeclared voters who could also go vote in the Republican primary and a very uh, moderate to, I'd say, center-left electorate in New Hampshire. And tr with all of that, Trump still won by double digits, I think around 11 or 12 points yeah. is where it's going to settle out. Uh, I think that's a massive victory for him. I think you could make the argument that it's a bigger a bigger victory and a bigger thrashing than he put on Ron DeSantis in Iowa, all things considered what was going on in New Hampshire. I, I just don't see people talk about the path forward, which is a phrase that I think is overused, but I just don't think one exists for Nikki Haley or for anybody else. This was always Donald Trump's nomination, and now we're just seeing proof of it. All right, folks, I got a question. Are we all being lied to? Because you think about this big banks and Wall Street, they all want us to put our money into an IRA or a 401k. The question is, is there a better way? Are we risking our lives in like a Wall Street casino to secure our investments for the future? Studies show the average American who follows the advice will actually outlive their savings by 10 years. So the question is, are you getting what you need? A man who invented the 401k says it's actually a failed experiment that should be destroyed. So think about this. You can have guaranteed predictable growth and retirement income if you go to bank on yourself. Bankonyourself.com slash Spicer. Your plan goes forward. No matter what, if the market tumbles, you still make out. You have your principal and your growth are locked in. It's tax-free retirement income. You'll know what your tax rate will be in retirement. Zero under current tax law, which protects you from the coming tax tsunami. Uh, you're in control. You get access to your money for any purpose. No questions asked. That's not how it works with an IRA or a 401k, right? 
bank on yourself, totally different model here. You get peace of mind. You know the minimum guaranteed value of your retirement savings on the day that you plan to tap into and at every point along the way. So if you want guaranteed, predictable annual growth and control of your money in tax-free retirement income, go to bankonyourself.com slash Spicer, bankonyourself.com slash Spicer, and they're going to send you a free report uh, that tells you about all of these opportunities. Bankonyourself.com slash Spicer. There's a lot I want to break into because I think your your path forward comment is spot on. And that's what I, but, and there's so many ways I want to go with that. So I'll, I'll start with this because I thought it was interesting. Yesterday on the show, we had Tyler Bauer, the national committee man uh, to the RNC from Arizona. And I asked him, how's the RNC going to react to all this if Trump wins the second one? And because there's going to be a lot of pressure to make him the presumptive nominee so they consolidate resources, start raising more money, et cetera. And sure enough, Ronna McDaniel comes out. Let me play you the clip of, of her and what she says. Looking at the math and the path going forward, and I don't see it for Nikki Haley. We need to unite around our eventual nominee, which is gonna be Donald Trump. And we need to make sure we beat Joe Biden. So that's her. I mean, just think about it. She's saying, and I, I gotta be honest with you, Shock, you say, I mean, she literally says to your point, the path forward, I don't see it for Nikki Haley. That's her exact quote. She ran a green campaign, blah, blah, blah. You just heard the clip. But I was, I gotta be honest with you, pleasantly surprised to see that happen. And I think she sees the writing on the wall in a lot of ways, right? She needs the money. She needs the party to coalesce. And I think going into an RNC meeting in a couple of weeks in, in Vegas, they, they, they know that like, we, we need to keep the party together. Yeah. And I think that's right. And, you know, and, and as chairwoman of the party, I think that's it's in her interest to try to get things uh, consolidated as quickly as possible so that uh, the, the main opponent, who we assume is going to be Joe Biden, uh, can be dealt with uh, beginning right away. And you're talking about resources here. Uh, I think Nikki Haley is getting a lot of her resources from a lot of Democrat donors and, and a lot of uh, you know moderate donors who may or may, or may not ever uh, support President Trump. But the fact is, the president, if the longer this goes on, the longer President Trump's campaign is going to have to be expending its own resources. And these every dollar spent fighting uh, Nikki Haley because she won't do, admit that she can't possibly win is a dollar that they can't spend running against Joe Biden in the fall. And so I think it, it's in everyone's interest on the Republican side to get it finally nailed down to one candidate running against one candidate. And everyone knows that uh, barring some sort of existential thing that pops up, President Trump is going to be running. It's going to be a rematch of 2020. So let's get on with it. I think that is the overwhelming view. And look, I think it was always going to be insurmountable for any candidate who was not Donald Trump. A super majority of Republican voters want him to be president again. No one was ever going to chip away with that, uh, chip away at that. That's just how it is. So let's move on. Exactly. Yeah. And that's the thing that I found interesting that let me ask you this tactically. I thought it was actually, I will give her credit for this. She came out the polls, of all of the polls closed at eight. And I don't know what the exact time was, like 820 or whatever. The the big cities, well, for New Hampshire, Concord, Manchester, Nashua, are, are coming in, which are going to favor her. They're the Boston suburbs where a lot of those independents and Democrats had voted. The The race was as narrow it was, as it was going to be. And she ran out and spoke. And I thought to myself, okay, I will give her credit because the media is going to say, wow, she's actually doing better because I, and I kept telling people this, trust me, Trump's support is further out. It's more rural, more Northern, more Western. It's going to take a little while longer to get those results in. So she capitalized on the moment, got out, said, oh, look at how close it is. I'm headed to South Carolina. Tactically speaking, just as a professional, do you give her any credit for that move? Yeah, I think so. You know, I was surprised that she came out as early as she did. But, you know, you could kind of read the mood on Twitter if you're looking at journo Twitter. Uh, when it was a little bit tighter than people thought at the very beginning when those urban votes were coming in, uh, the, you know, journo Twitter was a little bit giddy. We're like, oh, boy, Nikki's doing really well. This is not going to be a huge banner night for Trump. And you could sense the sort of the upbeat, optimistic mood among the journalists who were tweeting about it. And I, and I think that's the moment roughly about the time where Nikki Haley said, you know, I better get out there because it's it's never going to get better because but that's kind of a microcosm of the whole thing, though, isn't it? New Hampshire as a state, there's no other state that's going to be as good as that. She'll never have right. a moment where she could get as close to Trump as she did last night. And in that evening, within that evening, she picked the time where the numbers were as tight as they were ever going to get. She knew it was going to widen out at that point. So, yeah, give her give her credit for Wait. that. She's moving on to South Carolina and, and she's skipping the caucuses in Nevada. But don't so you think, yeah, South I, again, we keep like, I, every time you say, I'm like, OK, 10 more questions here. But. 
The thing that was interesting to me is I, I two things. One, I said this early in, in the night, we had a live stream going as results were coming in, that I thought it was like, I thought this was an opportunity for her when she got smoked, which is what she did, that she could take that one moment that she's going to have all this immediate attention and kind of do the right thing, what Vivek did in Iowa and say, you know what, with all the eyes on you, because that's the number one, that's the biggest attention moment that you're going to get. And instead, it was very telling. She's like, I'm going to make this about me and I'm going to try to pretend that I can play on, which is just upsetting people more and more. And frankly, clearly upset President Trump. Uh, tactically, you could hear, he said, I normally didn't want to come out here, but you know, she tried to take a victory lap. And that was the thing is I felt like she was pulling the wool over everyone's eyes by saying like, you know, we did really well. It's like, dude, you got crushed, crushed in Iowa. You put all of your chips into New Hampshire. You had the current governor, you had general Bolduck out there campaigning with her and, and Sununu had said, she's going to win. She's going to win. She's going to win. And then she takes this double digit spanking and claims a victory lap. From over. There are dozens of states left to go. And the next one is my sweet state of South Carolina. It's a little bit strange to watch her deliver two victory speeches when she finished third and a distant second both times. You know, it's kind of funny. And, uh, you know, a, a mutual friend of ours, uh, Hogan Gidley, said that he, his, he's from South Carolina. He said, you know, she might move on to South Carolina and just campaign for a couple of weeks and see how it goes. But if it gets close to Election Day, which is almost a month from now, and she's still down by 30, 35 or 40 points like she is right now, she might hang it up before that election rolls around. But right now she might go down there, test the waters, see if there's any possibility of a little bit of a bump. And if there's not, maybe then she'll she'll begin to save face. But I, she is not in saving face mode yet. That's for sure. I feel like and I agree. I think that that's actually what she's going to do. But I, I feel like. I don't know, maybe I just gave her team more credit than that. You actually have 30 days between now and then. And I feel like she's just going to, she had X amount of gas in the car and she's just going to let it stall out, which is an embarrassing way to end because at some point, all of these elected officials, all of these leaders in South Carolina who know her the best, I mean, heck, she appointed Tim Scott to the Senate. She was friends with Nancy Mace. They've all said, nope, we're going with Trump. And I, I just, to your point, I, do you really want to get spanked in your home state where you're governor twice? Yeah, I think if it comes down to that, if that election is getting close and she's still down by 30 points uh, on the, in the polling average, I think they'll, she'll probably have a serious conversation about you know, getting out before that would occur because it would be uh, really historically embarrassing to you know, act like you are in this race and then go home to where sh- what should be the friendliest terrain that you could possibly find and get royally smoked again worse than in the other two states. Uh, I think any politician who's thinking would want to try to avoid that. So we'll see. We'll see. All right, folks, if you're worried about your financial future and under the Biden economy, who isn't, uh, you should do what I did. I called Bishop Gold Group. You can go to bishopgoldgroup.com slash Sean, or you can give them a call. Actually, I did the call because I I like to talk to someone. 844-984-1616. And I had a conversation with them about my financial needs, what I was looking for in terms of retirement. Uh, Some people want to talk about rolling over an IRA. Some people want to keep precious metals. Some people want them to keep them. Some people want to know how you actually cash out precious metals. But I made them part of my investment strategy. I had a conversation with them. I talked about my financial, where I was and where I wanted to be. And we created a strategy. And these guys know what they're talking about. Integrity is part of their ethos there at Bishop Gold Group. So give them a call or go to bishopgoldgroup.com slash Sean. If you go to the website, you actually get a special promotion to start your journey toward uh, prosperity with precious metals. But I did it as well. I did exactly what I'm asking you to do. Go to bishopgoldgroup.com slash Sean and find out how precious metals can be part of your future. And like I said, there's a lot of people out there talking about this. These are the folks that I trust. These are the people who I know, know what they're talking about and have your interest at heart. bishopgoldgroup.com slash Sean. The thing that's different is that you're not gonna get the level of independents and Democrats to come in and vote for you the way that they did in New Hampshire. So that's why I'm like, I just, I feel like you're, you're going to run the gas out of, you're going to run the car out of gas before you get to it and have this epic, like, like it looks like a tire losing air and you're just going to stall in the middle of the highway. 
which again, I'm not too concerned about her future, but I, I thought that maybe they would, uh, they would care about how they ended this thing. Um, and, and maybe. I, I yeah. get, I get, I guess. So let me just ask you this from a different perspective. When Vivek dropped out in Iowa and embraced Trump, you saw those people on stage last night, Tim Scott, Vivek Ramaswamy, Doug Burgum, all of his former rivals getting behind him. I, I think that at a certain point you piss him off enough that he just says, I don't like, she's not going to be able to come back from the abyss. No, I don't think so. I mean, I think she is squarely in the never Trump camp and, and I don't know. And, and I don't know that she would agree to do it. I mean, can you actually picture Nikki Haley going up on stage with Trump and, and, and putting her arms around him? I, I'm, I have a hard time envisioning that, you know, and so she might be counting on the same kind of thing in South Carolina that she was banking on North Carolina. I mean, it's my understanding, South Carolina, you don't register by party. Correct. So it's an open primary Democrats, people who identify themselves personally, no one registers as a Democrat, but you can go vote in a Republican in primary if you want to, because there's no party registration. That, however, presupposes that Democrats won't want to vote in their own primary. And, that's, and they didn't we're, face we're, that last Biden night. Is going right. to appear. That's the, right. It was a free so shot a for these guys last night. That was the deal. She's, that, that's why I think the, the point that you made earlier, that was the most favorable ground that you could possibly ask for. And if you, it's sort of like that, you know, the Frank Sinatra, if I can't make it there, I'll make it anywhere. <laughs> like she can't, right. she couldn't make it there. She's not going to make it anywhere. Mm. Right. She couldn't get with him. The 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 yeah, that's okay. That's all right. I'm not a huge Sinatra <laughs> fan, but you know, it, it, all those favorable conditions and she couldn't get it to within, you know, to a down below a, a two possession game in North, in New Hampshire to use a football analogy, then, you know, moving on to other States where it's going to be rockier for her. I mean, she's got realistically, she, somebody has to talk to her inside her camp and say, listen, here's the math. Right. You know, and you're just burning donor money for what? It's a vanity exercise at that point. But the, the, like, so, so South Carolina is a month away. Again, I have a hard time seeing how you stay into them, but who cares? You're, you don't have to spend as much because you, you live there maybe. Uh, and by the way, I pointed this out last night before she said she was going to go. On. I was like, you know, every politician always says, you know, I'm going on no matter what, da, da, da. And they have to say that. That's just, you have to. Sure. The difference- with, They were saying that in DeSantis' camp right, right up to the moment he quit. Correct. Right? But the difference last yeah. night, I, it dawned on me midday yesterday, she lives in South Carolina. So it was completely intellectually honest to say, I'm going on to South Carolina because no matter what, either still in the race or out, she knew that she could say that and, and feel like with, with a, you know, with a clean conscience. And I thought, okay, that's cute because you can definitely say that you're definitely going on to South Carolina. But it was it, to me that the fascinating part about it was is that there there is no mandate. I mean, as you say, like you lose, you come in third in Iowa, you come in second by double digits in both cases, and somehow claim that you're you're got momentum. I, I just I I think that there's even that what what was shocking to me, and this is what I want to get as a comms guy, get your take on. I thought to myself, how the media portrays this right is going to be fascinating. The Today Show this morning, out of the gate, not great. Politico's headline was Nikki Haley failed. That's Politico. They they are no fans of Donald Trump. They want Nikki Haley to do well. And when I saw the media not give her this, wow, she came close answer, I thought to myself, wow. Yeah, and and I think they were definitely rooting for her, and, that, and like I said, the I noticed on Twitter there was definitely a mood of giddiness when when the numbers were were very close early on in the evening, and I think her message has largely been aimed at uh, middle and uh, left of center people, and also the media. Now, if you're a Republican and you and you look at her and what her strategy has been, and her strategy has been to try to court non Republicans to come vote in a Republican primary. I mean, I think a lot of a lot of Republican rank and file voters would look at that and think, you know, whose nominee are you trying to be exactly? You know, and when and when you can only capitalize in primary situations where independents or Democrats can come vote for you, then you're not really running to represent the Republican Party. So I, I you know, I sort of question what it is that she's trying to achieve here because she's not going to be the nominee. So is she trying to damage the party? I, I don't know. Yeah, apparently, according to one of the exit polls, she received only 25% self-described Republicans yesterday. 
Uh, and it's just, you can't, I mean, you're trying to win the Republican nomination. The thing right. on, on the flip side, according to Trump is, uh, I did read a bunch of these. He came up short of the 22% lead that he had. And I'm like, wait a second, that was one poll. It was a tracker and it was all based on a model about how many independents would vote, which clearly a lot more did. The thing that's fascinating, you made this point, no one's won Iowa and New Hampshire since 1976. Number two, and this is the fascinating point. He won effectively last night the most votes of either party in a New Hampshire primary. He bested Bernie Sanders' record from 2016. So this idea that he didn't do as well, is just, I, I, again, it's a Republican primary. He got 49%, uh, I mean, excuse me, he beat her by 49% among Republican voters. That is a spanking by any political definition. And, and yet, again, it was like, well, she didn't win, but let's not give him the full credit for what he did. Yeah. And look, this is the knot that uh, the media tries to tie itself in. You may remember about a week ago when Donald Trump gave a speech and he talked about Democrats coming in to infiltrate the Republican primary in New Hampshire, which they can do. Right. A, a large segment, CBS News and some others, CNN, of course, called him a liar and said, that's not true. He's making that up. The deadline to switch parties was back in October. Fine. Four thousand, four thousand Democrats changed parties from Democrat to Republican to go vote in that primary that was yesterday. You have a bunch of Democrat identifying undeclared, basically independent uh, candidates or voters going to go vote in the Republican primary. That's absolutely what was happening. Democrats were infiltrating the Republican primary and the media called him a liar for saying so. And then when all those Democrats do vote and cut his victory margin down, they say, wow, it wasn't a very good performance by Trump. Well, you can't have both. Did the Democrats get in and affect the primary or was he lying when he said that they could? This is the knot that the, Dem that the media and Democrats have to tie themselves in when they don't want to admit what's actually happening, which is that this primary is effectively over and it has been from the very beginning. Do you think, I, I know we both agree that they want Nikki Haley to drag this out, but do, do you effectively think that a lot of these guys really want a rematch? Not, not the voter necessarily, but the, but the media folks. I think they want a Trump-Biden rematch. I mean, I think that's a popular thing to say, but I, I think it's actually true. Just take a look at all the, I mean, I could, I could rattle off a dozen names of journalists who wrote books about Trump, right? Do you think, you don't think they want to write another one? I mean, come on. And plus all the clicks that they get on social media. And uh, Donald Trump is the best thing that's happened to journalism in the last half century. They don't want him to they don't want to ex him to exit the stage. Of course not. Yeah. It's funny how many of these news organizations from CNN, and The New York Times, Washington Post, their subscriptions, their viewership went up. And to your point, how many of these journalists, Jonathan, Carl and other have literally made a boatload of cash off of Trump? They need him. They want him. You know, I feel like it's yeah. like that thing. You want me on that wall. Lieutenant Cassie. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Never mind the so-called Republicans who are making banking uh, banking money now, making their careers based on the fact that they oppose Trump. You know, we always talk about Republicans who try to get uh, you know love from the left. You know, the left is never going to truly love you when you have run out of uses for them. They will discard you. And it's, and if you're a never Trump Republican and you're you're on TV all the time bashing Donald Trump when he's gone, what do they need you for? Exactly. They don't. Yeah. You know, you are. Uh, CNN's going to cut their their contributors in half easily. When they <laughs> yeah, were. Exactly. So last night it was funny because in Iowa and I gave Trump and I think it wasn't just me, Hannity and others after Iowa, he had a pitch perfect victory speech. He was. He had the right tone. He was thanking people. He was conciliatory towards his opponents. And I think he thought rightly so that they saw they would see the writing on the wall sooner rather than later drop out. Obviously, Vivek did that night. DeSantis did within days. Last night, I, he seemed a little bit more upset. And he said, literally, I don't get mad. I don't get even. And I got to think to myself, if you're Nikki Haley, he is now going to spend the next 30 days before South Carolina just destroying you. Yeah. And, and look, and the media looks at him and says, oh, my gosh, look at him. He's back to his old self again. But this is a this is a primary election. Right. There is, he is a candidate and he's got an opponent and it's now one on one. Like she said, she wanted all along. OK, well, this is what happens when you run against <laughs> Donald Trump. Every everyone has seen it. And I think that, you know, conciliatory Donald Trump, the media doesn't like that. And uh, he, he would rather be in there mixing it up. There's no question about that. I do think I think we ought to talk about how disciplined his campaign has been. Right. You know, Donald 
Donald Trump is going to go out and he's going to be Donald Trump. And and that's just what you expect from him. But his campaign apparatus has been extraordinarily disciplined. I mean, their message discipline on television and the way that they went at Nikki Haley from both the right and the left, I think, was actually really very clever. And I think you you see him running a really, really tight, excellent and well-focused campaign. And, you know, the president goes out there and throws haymakers. I mean, that's who he is. That's all part of it. That's the Trump campaign. Is that staff? uh, Is that do you think that's the staff that that's meaning the the Chris Las Savitas and the Susie Wiles that are at the top of the chain? I mean, I think you're right. I mean, there's something different about this. I I feel like, you know, the three little bears, you know, when it was like the porridge. 2016, we we caught lightning in a bottle. I'll, I admit that all the time. We got the right candidate. He had the right message. We had the right combination of of but in 2020. Um, you know, it's, it was hard to, to recapture this outsider feel for an incumbent president. This time I feel yeah. like he went in, they found the right porridge. Yeah, I think this time it is it is working for him in 2020. I mean, let's not forget the the global pandemic. Oh yeah, yeah, I yeah. Think was I, I firmly having been there right when it was all happening two years during the 20. 20- 20 race, 19, 2019 and 2020. If not for COVID, I think President Trump would be president oh, right I, now. No, I I no question. He, he would have ridden the economy. So, you know, the 2020 thing was a major, major wrench thrown into everything. It got, you know, it upset the world and millions of people were killed and it became uh, a complication for the race as well. Um, but this, the, what you're seeing now is, I think, a really professionally run campaign and I think it's serving the president well. And he is able to be sort of the, the uh, go out there and, and throw the punch is while on the air war on TV, they're very disciplined as far as what messages they're running and how they're running them and how much and where. Hey folks, let me ask you a question. When things go sideways, are you going to be prepared? As a graduate of the Naval War College and as a former White House press secretary, I was involved in a lot of contingency planning and preparation. The good thing for all of us is that if things go wrong in a natural disaster or we lose power for days, weeks, or even longer, We've got you covered. I want to introduce you to the Patriot Power Generator 2000X. It will have you covered. It is so strong that it can actually run your refrigerator. So if you or a loved one depends on medicine that needs to be refrigerated, it has you covered. It runs solely off solar power and a solar panel comes with your order if you go now to fordpatriots.com slash Spicer. Think about it. It may be hours, days, weeks. Who knows that you could be without power? But with four Patriots, you're covered. Go to fourpatriots.com slash Spicer. You never know when you're going to need it. And the beauty is because this entirely runs off solar power and the panel comes with it, you'll be covered. Taking care of your neighbors, your friends, your family members, and yourself in these critical times is what matters. So with the Patriot Power Generator 2000X, you can run your refrigerator and all of your other devices for hours without having to worry about it. Go to fourpatriots.com slash Spicer to get your offer. So so let me flip over because it's interesting. Um, Biden last night made it very clear in these stops that they, they are looking at Donald Trump as their nominee, their opponent. And, and I thought to myself, mm-hmm. there's a, probably a couple reasons for this. Um, one, they, like everybody else, see the writing on the wall. Two, their own base in polling apparently doesn't think that Trump will end up being the nominee. And I think they're trying to convince their base this is real. This is who we're running against. Is that what, what do you think the reason is that Biden wants to name Trump as his opponent as quick as he did last night? Well, one, that's, I mean, that's just a strategy that's based in reality. Right. Trump is going to be the opponent. If Biden is on the ballot, then his opponent is going to be Trump. And, you know, there's a pretty vocal segment of the Democratic Party who don't want they don't want Joe Biden to be on the ballot. But let's say let's say that it is going to be Biden. Then he's just dealing with reality because Trump is going to be his opponent. Now, he he, he is probably once that has been determined, you have to pretend like it's the opponent that you want. Right. Um, I don't think that there's anybody that Joe Biden will handle easily. I don't think he's going to handle Donald Trump easily, because now what you've set up is a contrast between the successes of the two administrations back to back. Almost every voter, you know, there are going to be some who are voting for the first time because they've just turned 18 this time around. But almost every voter can remember the two different administrations and put them side by side. Exactly. And I think I thought I don't think Joe Biden wins that comparison. And I frankly don't think it's very close, even with COVID thrown into the mix. I think Donald Trump beats him on policy and success of administration. Well, you know, the funny thing is 2016 was a, a notional race his potential and hypothetical policies versus Hillary Clinton's policies. In 20, 
20, you're right. COVID clouded everything. You had Trump, not, and, and a lot of his accomplishments were overshadowed by what was going on in that global pandemic. But then Biden could hide in his basement and just say, you know, I won't tweet. That's really what he did. And now I, I've told people all the time when I do interviews or talk to people that like there, there is no clear of a contrast that we've ever had in any, I don't know, it, it's possible in any election ever, but definitely in the modern uh, era, the, our, our modern history. You'd be able to say, here's the four years of Trump domestically and internationally, put it up against the Biden, you know, what will be almost four years. It's crystal clear, pick. That's all it comes down to, to me. It's so easy and simple to make this. And I don't mean to undermine the job that the, the Trump campaign has this time, but the, the argument is simple. Did you like energy independence, a secure border, lower taxes, higher employment, uh, a calm foreign policy, or do you want to see nutty nut, you know, a, a, an influx of millions of people at our border, higher interest rates, higher inflation, um, more people struggling to get by and every region of the world in chaos. Yeah. And like on the, there's a couple of things that are going to be really difficult messaging points for Joe Biden, I think. And one is the border. He's really, they're really trying to have it all ways on the border. They're, they're trying to say that there is no problem and that the border is as secure as it ever has been. Yet it's those dastardly Republicans in Congress who won't help us fix the border. Well, which is it? Does it need fixing? Or are you guys doing a bang up job? You know, I mean, it's pretty, there's a reason why people show up at the border wearing Biden t-shirts and saying, telling reporters, we came here because Joe Biden said that he would let us in. Um, and the other thing is the economy. The White House likes to brag about, oh, X million number of jobs created since Biden took office. But that completely ignores the wiping out of millions of jobs because of COVID. Right. Those are those are jobs that are returning after a global pandemic. Joe Biden didn't have anything to do with that. Well, the, it's the, that the pandemic passed. In, in both of those issues, uh, Tim, it's, <laughs> it's like you're asking people to disbelieve reality, right? Everybody went through right. COVID. So it's not like um, only part of the country did and therefore they don't, everyone else doesn't understand it. We all went through it. So don't lie to us. We get the job thing. And then on the border thing, you just literally sued the state of Texas to cut wire, right? This yeah. isn't, there's no like, don't, you can't right. claim that you're trying. The other factor that I want to just, I mean, is the age factor. I mean, you, unless the guy becomes Benjamin Button, it doesn't get better. It gets worse. It does. And, you know, you can see if you look at the social media feeds of Biden and the Democrats, they're they're trying to sort of mitigate that by attacking Trump on the same topic. But I mean, if you put Donald Trump's schedule side by side and watch the way he goes out there and performs side by side with Joe Biden, there is no contest. I mean, I can remember and I know uh, you remember days like this, too. The guy starts his morning. God knows what time before the sun comes up. He starts sending off texts to people saying, hey, did you see this overnight? Did you see that overnight? <laughs> he worked all day in the White House. And then at about four o'clock in the afternoon, he'll go get on the airplane and fly somewhere, deliver a rally speech for an hour and a half, fly back to the uh, White House, get home in about midnight. And at 5 a.m. the next morning, he does it all over again. Uh, yeah. And there's no no way Joe Biden, who does like two or three public events per week, is ever going to be able to keep up but with that. It's, no it's, way. It's to me, though, it's it's bigger than that. I mean, you're right about the schedule. Absolutely. But it's also just the visual factor. You watch him last night when he got into Iowa. He reans into his pocket and just pulls out a list. I assume it was a list of names, but it was like folded and halfway. And, and then he riffed for a while. Joe Biden stands there and we'll talk about this in a minute. So I don't want to get ahead of it, but you know, wherever he goes every day, he can't even read off the teleprompter without a word. And it's actually interesting. I, I said this this morning to somebody else. He doesn't have, Kamala has word salads. He has verbal I don't know what, like salads, because they're, they're not a word. He just goes, hurry, hurry, cha, mm. cha, 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 cha. <laughs> yeah. Trump is People limit. who have tried to caption these things and spell what these words are. I mean, Can you uh, imagine being a gosh. White House stenographer? <laughs> That's a job. Right now they're like, I don't know what that was. Is that Spanish? <laughs> um, what did he say? Uh, so the, mm. the, the news from out of this morning, speaking of the Biden campaign that was fascinating, it's, I'll read you the headlines. It says Biden is shifting things around. At the head of the re-election effort, Deputy Chief of Staff Jennifer O'Malley Dillon is heading from the White House to the campaign as his senior advisor, Mike Donnell. And despite the shakeup, Julie Chavez Rodriguez, who, who is the campaign manager, will remain campaign manager. And whose, right. her, her quote was, I'm excited to have an all, hand, all hands on deck approach. So what she tells the uh, uh, NBC. Sure. Yeah, I, I'm sure I get, I would love to be demoted and sidelined. I'm so excited. Thank you for asking. Um, 
I know it's getting swept under the rug, but the thing that's interesting to me is, is it a campaign shakeup that's needed or is it a, is it him? You know, it's probably somebody that he's familiar with and, and comfortable with. No, I, no, I no, 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 but well, I'm sorry. I, I, let, let me ask this a different way. Does it matter mm. how many times you rearrange the deck chairs on the Titanic? Oh. Is the ship still going down? It's not a staff issue. No, no, it's not a staff issue. And and I think that anybody who, it's, it's kind of like when uh, there's a terrible football team and the coach gets fired mid-season and the replacement interim coach comes in and looks around and says, man, all these players are really terrible. It's kind of the same thing. Um, they're, they're still, Joe Biden is still the candidate and he's the incumbent president of the United States. And if he wants to remain on the ballot, he's going to remain on the ballot. And I'm afraid that they're stuck with him. Um, it's interesting that they announced that on the day of the New Hampshire primary, yes. where every reporter in the whole universe was focused on what was going on in New Hampshire. And at, it was at that exact moment that the Biden campaign decided to sneak some people over from the White House over. You can talk about like a Friday afternoon news dump. This is like the king of that. Oh, that, Do it right on New Hampshire primary day. I, and it was buried everywhere. I get it. I, I think the idea was it was it was it was a bat signal to donors and activists and Obama people that, hey, we heard you. We need to change things up. And so here are, here are the two sacrificial lambs that are moving from D.C. to Wilmington. But we need to do something and we're going to get the message. Because, But again, I, I'm, I keep saying to myself, okay, great. You're sending, and it's nuts. They are two trusted aides. I mean, he, there's no question that Donilon and O'Malley Dillon are very close to Biden. But they knew this from the jump when they started this campaign. And Axelrod, David Axelrod has been saying, hey, look, you need to have key folks up there. It's just to me, it's like at some point they're not going to make him younger or change his position on the border. And those are issues that resonate everywhere right now. Yeah. Yeah. They're, I mean, they're not going to be able to help improve him or somehow fix the policies that haven't been working for the last three years. And, and I think, you know, we, you talked about it a little bit there about how he ran the basement campaign in 2020 and never, never emerged from his basement very much because of COVID and used that as the reason why he didn't. I think now you'll see them lean on a lot uh, the fact that he is the president and you know, oh, he's got a job to do and you'll see him run what they used to call a Rose Garden strategy, which is run for, re run for re-election right. without leaving the White House very much at all. Because they know if he goes out on the campaign trail and actually has to interact with voters, that's where he's at his worst and that's where he's going to get into real trouble. And terrible things can happen when Joe Biden is out there on a stage by himself. We know that. He can fall down, he can trip over something, he gets lost. He doesn't know which way to go when he's done talking. Like as though they either have the worst advanced staff in the history of advanced staffs or he just doesn't know what's going on. Because don't you tell the president how to escape from the stage? You don't tell him where to go when he's done talking or have or arrows he, on the he, floor. I mean, it, or something, something. Yeah. I mean, you know how it goes. They don't want the president of the United States up there looking like he doesn't have a clue what's going on. And this happens routinely. All right. Well, so it's not advanced staff. So speaking of that, we both live in Virginia. Um, he was in Virginia yesterday trying to take shots at Trump. Um, I mentioned the, the verbal salads. They're not word salads. Here's what he said yesterday uh, about our, our, our governor and, and well, let's, let's just play it. Hello, Virginia. <laughs> and the real governor, Terry McAuliffe. Here's the thing, Tim. I, when I listened to that, there was a lot of people online that said he's an election denier. Um, because he's saying your real governor, Terry McAuliffe, right? I, I, I don't know. I, I'm literally like, okay, is he election denier or is he clueless or I, is it a combination? Of, I was like, I don't know what to think sometimes. And that was like, I, I literally was going, okay, is he trying to be funny? Is he clueless? Is he denying the election? Because there was no malfeasance in that election in, in, in the sense that neither Terry McAuliffe nor Glenn Youngkin nor anyone else claimed that that was an, that there was anything wrong with how Virginia ran its election ever. So what, what, I don't, what, what did you make of it? I, I made it, I think, you know, and this is a guess because I'm not inside the, the man's head. Thank God. <laughs> There's plenty um, of room. <laughs> Yes, there is one. There's a lot of stuff rattling around in there and a lot of empty space. Um, <clears throat> I think that it was a nod and an attempt to be funny, but it's kind of a nod at the wing of the democratic party 
uh, who views elections that are not won by Democrats as being stolen. And we know that's true. We know those people exist, and we know it's a sizable segment of the Democratic Party. The media loves to focus on Republicans who like to talk about the 2020 election, and uh, that's what the media is going to do. But Democrats do it all the time. Joe Biden just did it yesterday, calling Terry McAuliffe the rightful governor or the real governor, however he phrased it, of Virginia, when the governor is, in fact, Glenn Youngkin, who beat Terry McAuliffe because Terry McAuliffe was the worst candidate in history, That's despite having despite having been governor once already before. But Biden's not alone in doing this. You know, Stacey Abrams is the imaginary governor of Georgia still. She might be in her second term as the imaginary governor of Georgia, (laughs) since we're talking about it. Hillary Clinton uh, always talked about the 2016 election. The White House press secretary, a job with which I know you're familiar, Sean, uh, is an election denier and says that 2016 was an election that was stolen. And, And Kamala Harris, the vice president of the United States, says that the election was stolen in 2016. So, goes on and on and on. And Democrats can say this kind of stuff with impunity, including the president of the United States. But if one Republican pipes up and says, you know, I think maybe there might have been some things wrong with Pennsylvania in 2020. Everybody goes, oh, prove it, prove it, prove it. You know, and it's just it's just a mess. Yeah, and so everybody this wait, is they, one of the many things. Everyone in one the one media the yesterday things. just d- didn't even they, they ignored the comment. No. They didn't even try to figure out what he's saying. It's just like, OK, move on, move on. It, yeah, but yeah. you know what? That was a perfect opportunity for the media to insert their favorite phrase. When it comes to Trump, they love to say, he said, without, without evidence. evidence. Uh, the, perfect opportunity for that. Trump makes a joke. No. He, he was joking yesterday about something and they said he went attacked and he went, it's like, oh my God, they never let it go. And then with Biden, it's just like nothing to see here, move on. Uh, I want to cover, yeah. there, there's something I do want to get your take on. I brought it up at the beginning, this Carrie Lake uh, leaked audio. She's having a conversation mm-hmm. with the state Republican um, chairman right now. Um, and, and I want to just play a piece of it. Jeff DeWitt, Jeff DeWitt actually was the CFO of, of the 2016 campaign for those like, uh, and he had been the state treasurer of, of Arizona. He's the chairman. Now this is him talking right to Carrie Lake. Assuming this is our friend. Uh, this is, this is, this is back East. They, there are very powerful people that want to keep you out. I know oh, they do. But they're willing to put their money where their mouth is, in a big way. So, this conversation never happened. This is crazy though. They should want me. I'm a great candidate. People love me. These people are corrupt. Well, maybe you're right. They are right. They are corrupt. Maybe. This is a wrap. Don't, don't go. Do you though. I don't get myself in trouble. This, if you, if you, if you say no, which is fine, it's your choice. Don't tell people. They're going to try to have me murdered. <laughs> so here's what, in my 30 years of doing campaigns, he keeps saying the people back east want this to happen. Now, I, I've known party officials that want to push people out of a race and, and all this stuff, and they are donors or whatever. This sounded like something out of a movie on the, on the mafia and them saying, we're going to pay you to go away. Like, I, I've never, ever seen something like this. I, it's troubling. It's illegal. And I got to tell you, Carrie Lake scored a lot of points in this one for saying, I'm doing this for the right reason. Nothing going to get me out. I just, you've been involved in campaigns. I, have you ever seen anything like this? No, I, I, I have not. And uh, I don't, I'm not a, a lawyer of any kind and, and uh, certainly not a criminal attorney. And so I, <clears throat> I don't know if I'm sure somebody is looking into it uh, now that this tape has become public. And I just got to wonder about the circumstances. You know, I mean, uh, clearly it's a very clean audio recording. It's not over the phone. Right. It's in person. And so did Carrie. I don't know the circumstances of this. Did Carrie Lake have reason to believe that this conversation was going um, to take yeah, place I'm, and decided to tape it for her own protection? I, I don't know. I'm glad you brought that up because but, the way if you listen to the 10 minute version of the tape and I, I tweeted it out, there's two versions that have been floating around online to the five and the 10, the 10, they're together. They literally walk out together. And it's it, at least it sounds as though they're, they're the only two in the room. I have talked to sources very close to without getting into it that authenticate it. It's real. It's not. I wondered if it was AI. Nope, it's real. And it doesn't sound like anyone else is in the room, which means because they move outdoors, they're inside in the tape. And then you can tell they're walking down and Jeff DeWitt gets into his car, um, meaning that there's only two possibilities, either Jeff DeWitt taped it or Carrie Lake or somebody around Carrie Lake taped it because they're moving from inside to out. So you would have had to have a listening device to do that. I, I watch enough Matlock 
and Law and Order. That, <laughs> uh, oh, but but okay. I, I feel like <clears throat> you're right. Maybe it was like, hey, I know that I'm being set up again. I want to be, I want to have this. But this, this idea that there are people out East that set him up uh, is troubling. And I, I think that, like, I hope that we get to the bottom of this, that maybe it's real, maybe it's not. But the idea that somebody is offering money to get someone out of a race is a big deal. Yeah. It is. It is a big deal. And, um, you know, the way in the tape, the way that <clears throat> the back east is referred to. And I, and I think, you know, in Western states like Arizona, when people use the phrase people back east, it's meant uh, sort of as a phrase of mistrust. Like, you know, those back east people, they don't have our best interests at heart. And, and they talk about them like they're the shadowy figures who are, you know, out to do harm. I just and took I it as a D.C. Context. thing. Yeah, maybe. And I don't think that people use that phrase to describe D.C. people as well-intentioned. Uh, no. Uh, <clears throat> you know, and so, you know, it. I think what it really does is the criminal aspect aside, because, again, I, I don't know if it's a crime or not to have, to have done this. But what it does really is just underscore what Carrie Lake's message is and what a lot of MAGA type candidates right. uh, message is, is that the establishment is out to get us. They know that we are a threat. To their grip on power. And I think this just underscores that. I mean, what a powerful tape it is for Carrie Lake's oh, yeah. uh, efforts out there. And and it just, boy, it's it's a mess. When I heard this thing, I was chatting about it and texting with uh, other Republican campaign types that I know. And everybody's like, man, can you believe uh, this yeah. tape? Um, it's out of control. Before I go, 30 seconds, your new book is out on April 2nd. It's a compelling story about your journey. Just give me the, the 30 second elevator speech. It's called Swing Hard in case you miss it. Uh, I, I urge people to go to Amazon and, and, and pre-order it now because that's how books get determined, how they're going to do. So go to it, order Tim Martell's book. But Tim, give me the 30-second elevator pitch on this. Well, thanks for the opportunity, Sean. It's called Swing Hard in Case You Hit It. And it's available on Amazon for pre-order now. It comes out on April 2nd. And it's uh, about two things. First, it's about my journey through decades of alcoholism and how I was finally able to kick the habit and quit drinking in May of 2015. And then the other half of the book is my life in politics. And, and most of that is focused on the 2020 Trump campaign. But it's a story about uh, how I've tried and failed many, many times to avoid alcohol and, and get sober. And then I finally did it. it it's a tale about yeah. how I got there, how I managed to do it. And when I was in rehab, I used to read other people's stories and they helped me. And so I wanted to write a story that would help other people as well. Well, I hope it does. And I've already pre-ordered it. I urge everyone to go do it. Tim, thanks for being with us. I appreciate you all being with us. I enjoyed our live session last night. We'll keep doing it, which is why you need to subscribe. Hit the notification button. We'll see you back here tomorrow on The Sean Spicer Show. Well, if you enjoyed this content, make sure to like this video, subscribe and click the notification bell to get more.